Okay. In fact, when we come to compress images in the real world, we do this quite a lot. So when I took this original image, I actually had a perfect representation of the image, at least at that particular scale. I had a TIFF, right? The file format there means that, in fact, every single pixel in the file is registered as either being on or off, black or white. Okay. On the left-hand side, you can see what happens if I use my, unfortunately, non-patented compression algorithm, where, in fact, here, instead of compressing it using 10 by 10 grids, I do a much more or much less aggressive compression, where I only take little 3 by 3 grids. And, in fact, if you compare how ugly the 10 by 10 grid compression is, to the 3 by 3 grid compression, you might think, hey, that's pretty good. And in fact, by doing that, by going from a grid that's sort of 1 by 1 by keeping track of every pixel, and instead going to a grid that's 3 by 3, I've decreased the file size by a factor of 9. And in fact, what I also can do is take that TIFF file, and I open it up in Max Preview, and now what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask the computer, look, why don't you do some coarse graining for me? Because in fact, we spent a lot of time trying to figure out how to compress images, how to reduce their size, how to throw away the information that people don't need in order to allow the image to be transmitted faster, to be stored more conveniently. So on the right-hand side here, we also have a coarse graining of the Alice image, but now using a coarse graining algorithm called the JPEG. No one's ever referred to the JPEG as a coarse graining algorithm, at least they don't do it that much. Okay. And what you can see is both images look reasonably good. In fact, they have different properties. So let's go zoom in, in here on Dyna. And what you can see on the left-hand side is the majority vote coarse graining. One of the features of the majority vote, uh, vote coarse graining, by the way, you'll see, is that each pixel is still either black or white. If I zoom in again, and I guess Dyna is looking much more here like a rat now than she is like a cat. But if you zoom in on Dyna on the right-hand side, okay, you can see now the JPEG image has made different choices about what to keep and what to throw away. Importantly, one of the ways that JPEG works is not in what we call real space, or what the physicists call real space, but instead what's called Fourier space. We'll talk a little bit more about the distinction between those two ways to represent an image, but for now the simplest way to think of it is this. On the right-hand side, what I did was I took the representation of the image in the spatial field, so I took the entire array, and I turned it by taking chunks that were locally connected to each other. I took little local chunks from the image, and for each of those chunks, I did a little compression scheme. I said, in fact, all these differences here don't matter. You don't have to keep track of all the either 9 or 100 pixels within that square. In fact, I'm going to summarize it. I'm going to coarse grain it. I'm going to simplify it. I'm going to lossily compress it. All these words are equivalent, different ways and different fields, or rather, different ways that different fields have discovered to talk about this. I'm going to simplify all those pixels in a particular way. On the right-hand side, what the JPEG does is the following. It does a transformation on this image. Okay? It represents this image in a very different way. In fact, what it does is it represents the image in terms of the fluctuations that occur in it. So it takes the long wavelength parts of the image, the fact that in the center it's darker than it is around the edges, okay? and it puts that in one pixel. Okay? And then it also takes the high-frequency components, the wiggles, where the image is going from black to white very quickly along a line. And so here, for example, you can see on the back of the armchair where Alice is sitting, you can see these very fine grid lines. And what the JPEG does is it says, okay, like there's a patch here, okay, where things are oscillating very quickly. So I'm going to put that over in this high frequency part of the image data. It's also true of Alice's hair, right? If you look at Alice's hair there, she has these sort of kinky curls, right? And those curls, okay, have a high frequency component of the JPEG records. So what the JPEG does is it represents that image Okay. Now, instead of representing it spatially, so stuff on the left is physically stuff with, that was on the left in Tenniel's original recording, and instead what it does is it puts the low-frequency components in one part and the high-frequency components in the other part. And then it does two things. First of all, it blurs them, so it does a kind of chunking coarse graining on those components. And then also it just entirely cuts off all the high-frequency components in the image. Because there, the, there are parts of that image that you yourself are not sensitive to, and those parts are where the image starts fluctuating back and forth very quickly. And in fact, you can see it here. On the right-hand side, the JPEG looks smoother than in the compression I've done. In fact, what's so clever about the JPEG is that it actually respects the way in which the human eye records information. Amazingly enough, of course, when the human eye gets data from the real world and makes an image on the back of your retina, it appears almost like a set of pixels. 
But before it actually wants to transmit that image back into your brain to make decisions, it does itself a series of coarse grainings, using what are called Gabor functions and the particular sensitivity of the neurons. It does a particular set of coarse grainings that in fact the JPEG knows about. And so the things that your retina is going to throw out anyway as it transmits it backwards, the JPEG has already thrown out on your behalf. 